Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Grognard Files. Hello, my name is Dirk the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast. Talking Bob is about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. I'm coming live from my den, under the stairs, in Dirk Towers, in Adlington, Corley, in northwest of England. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Corley? Were the ex Corley? At least, when the machines rise up, they won't be able to find me in Chorley. I'm surrounded by my stuff. To my right is my great library of RPGs and my grognard files. This time the files are held on 5-inch floppy disks by my friend, the computer. To my left is my ridiculous homemade shrine to the actor Caroline Monroe. I'll just give it a tap. Oh my eyes. We seem to be having a malfunction. Well, I don't have sufficient clearance for this. It's Gary Newman and Caroline collaborating on Pump Me Up. Blimey, Charlie. Right, I'll I'll move that for now. Uh, The subject of uh, this episode of the Grog Pod is Paranoia and it's been selected by a poll of patrons. It was conducted on the general election day in 2017. Now, It was only an advisory poll, but if I didn't do an episode on paranoia, then I would be disrespecting the will of the Grog Squad. They voted by a significant whisker to cover a game that we never played back in the day, but it holds a fascination thanks to the vocal support that it has from grognards everywhere. Paranoia was published, fittingly enough, in 1984. It was the first role-playing game produced by New York-based board game, war game company West End Games. Written by Dan Gelberg, Greg Kostikian and Eric Goldberg. To help understand some of the aspects of the game, I'm extremely pleased to have a very special guest. Paul Budowski contributed to Paranoia when it was published by Mongoose in the noughties. He provides a potted history of the game, as well as offering some tips to help me games master my first time. Our good friend from Twitter, at Daily Dwarf, gives an overview of the surprisingly fecund amount of material that are featured in White Dwarf. I run a game of Paranoia Online, and I've captured a snippet of the game to share with you before Blythe joins me behind the Games Master screen to recount why we had the game but never played it okay ramblers let's get rambling open box welcome to open box part of the podcast where we look back so we can look forward it's a chance to reflect on how games from the past can impact on the way that we play today Uh, for this episode we're joined by paul budowski writer of the cthulhu hack he's a small press publisher of Just Crunch Games, and along with his wife Phil, the entrepreneur extraordinaire, thanks to All Rolled Up, the company that specialises in handmade gaming paraphernalia. He's also a paranoia player and a writer. Hello, Paul. Hello. Did, did I get everything in there then? I, I, I think I think you got a fair amount of it. There's, <laughs> there's a few bits hanging off the side somewhere, but I, I think that's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, perhaps we can uh, shove those things on, hanging off the side in over the next uh, <laughs> <laughs> over over this chat. Yes. Okay. Well, first off, let's ask uh, our usual traditional uh, question, which is, how did you get into the hobby? How did you start playing? Game wise, it was Red Box Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but the reason I got into gaming is is that it was so much better than being outside. In, in comprehensive school, I had already managed by the second year to wrangle my way into the brass band, which meant we had access to the music rooms during breaks and lunch. So rather than standing outside in the uh, pouring rain or the driving blizzard, um, we were in the warmth next to the radiator in the uh, in the in the music room or the practice rooms. At some point, 
red box D&D made an appearance, I uh, had my first taste of role-playing as Ironheart the Fighter. So really. it, was like, it was like uh, Trolls and Trumpets, was it, at Bunk's time? <laughs> Looking back on it now, it meant that we we sort of played remarkably compact sessions just during like lunch lunch break. Uh, it's a group that I then stuck with for a while after. Graham, John, Roy, and myself kind of took it in turns to be the GM. I, I think we kind of lost it these days. Uh, effectively, we each invested in a game um, so that nobody was sort of out of pocket. You would run a certain game and then it would go around to the next person and they'd have bought a game. So we started with D&D. Uh, someone else got Call of Cthulhu. In Games Workshop's heyday, when they, they produced the uh, second edition uh, box set of uh, Call of Cthulhu, my first game was the Middle-Earth role-playing game. Now, there's a lot of yeah. a lot of love of uh, Merp out there. So, was that the... Um Games Workshop edition. Yes, so it was the uh, Chris Sakalos uh, covered game with. I could never work out whether it was meant to be the Balrog or Sauron behind the tower with the great stream uh, streaming army coming, the sort of purple uh, dark background. As I said, it was kind of like the the heyday of of Games Workshop redoing sort of local reprints of American games. It still has pride of place somewhere amongst my collection not not far off from me here um it was definitely an experience i it was even more more so for my players because i, I have to admit i hadn't actually read lord of the rings oh wow that's, uh, that's probably the best way to play actually yeah <laughs> possibly, possibly yeah yeah uh, so some of the internal consistency of tolkien's uh, world might have been lost in translation to some of the adventures i ran and did that group continue uh, beyond school so that group went from as i said from like second year in the comprehensive through to um the end of our a levels we actually spent like a whole summer sort of the solid eight weeks virtually locked inside a uh, caravan in somebody's driveway so one of my friends had a caravan which was constantly parked out the front and we basically just took it over for the uh, entirety of the summer and just played games for the entire time by the time we reached the the end of a levels we all sort of went separate ways took up different careers um went uh, in different directions it was the beginning of the end that first period um of of role playing really life just took over and uh, yeah the real world and and jobs and so forth suddenly mm. took the priority and and role playing just became something i carried around in boxes whenever i moved house yes so and and nowadays uh, do you have a regular group the idea is that we play we try and play uh, once a week, uh, just it's just like very small group players, um, and it, it still gets disrupted a lot by people's lives. And um, I sometimes listen to people um, at conventions or online talking about the fact that they've been playing the same campaign for you know twenty years or something. Um, uh, we tried to run a game over the Christmas period just recently. And we had so many interruptions and breaks where not the same people turned up that after yeah. four weeks of playing in the final session, nobody could consistently re- remember what had previously happened. Um, so that the final climax of the adventure was a complete sort of uh, what happened there? What, uh, did, did we win? Did we, did, we, did, did we lose? I don't know. As I said, I'm really envious of people who managed to sort of play for years and years uh, because I've not had that experience probably since I left school. I, I honestly think those people are making it up. I think they're the equivalent of uh, <laughs> people who take photographs of the kids doing happy things um on facebook you know that <laughs> yeah it, it doesn't doesn't exist what what are the what are the games that you've got on rotation we we have, we are gamers who 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 are constantly being sold into into new games and new ideas and new systems that some old favorites will bob up every now and again so because we rarely get to play for very long think uh, systems like fate make make appearances because they they're sort of drop of a hat play at a, a moment's notice i think recently we played um tales from the loop um oh. which was quite an experience to see players uh, becoming their childhood selves uh, without any effort whatsoever it, 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 you play you play a lot of uh, is it symborium the yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The swedish game yeah that that Swedish game, yes. Yeah, yeah. Swedish game. That's all I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's got um, it's got ducks in it. That's all. 
it has to be said the 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 ducks they um they did the duck as a um as an april fools yeah Sim- simbrum has become a uh, uh, a bit of a favorite purely because the the uh, the art uh, is incredibly eye catching the the depth the actual storytelling within the 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 books is 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 very engaging as a, as a setting but it's very very dark are you sitting comfortably because i i want to start putting you on the couch now so when did you first get paranoid Having established that I had friends at school um, who I, I gamed with, um, both myself and my brother got into sort of games as well. And we would sort of have a Venn diagram of our friends would come together and we would play games we were somewhere in the middle of, uh, of that group. And my brother got paranoia. And I, 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 gen- I have I'd thought long and hard about this. I have no recollection of why um, or where he got it from. But he had the original white box uh, first edition paranoia with the um, the gorgeous triptych of illustrations, uh, which has uh, a, a group looking at another group who are looking at another group who are looking at the first group, which seemed to be the uh, moment that communicated what paranoia should be all about. How would you pitch uh, paranoia to people who've never played it because it's a game that uh, i think Blythe had but it kind of passed us by we we never played it back in the day the ele- the elevator pitch would be um something something along the lines of 1984 mixed with terry gilliam's brazil in a uh, a, a nuclear bunker with the, the the stooges and the marx brothers thrown in for good measure that sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the situation genuinely is you are in a bunker of some kind. Something terrible has happened. Um, you are one of the survivors, but it becomes very clear that things are both not serious, but desperately serious. You know, you are you are in danger of being killed at any moment. But that death is not the not the end. Um, because somebody was kind enough to develop cloning technology um, before everything went wrong, and an aspect of that technology has remained. So um, it's a little bit like Dungeon Crawl Classics funnel approach, where you're throwing lots of inexperienced characters at uh, a mincing machine and seeing which ones survive the process. In this case, it's tiny it's it's got the science fiction edge to it you only get one of those characters at a time but when he dies you get another one or you know when she dies you get another one um and so it allows a longevity of play you didn't just have the one adventure and everybody dies at the end because next week you'd be back again so where does the computer come into it you are effectively part of a community within this bunker which is being both managed and almost parented by the computer the computer is is the controlling element who's in charge of the way things should work making sure that things happen on time uh, a, a a voice which which is uh, ever present uh, a sort of personality in the background it's like the computer from 2001 a space odyssey but possibly less homicidal but only marginally so. And so the the bunk that you're in, is that where the Alpha Complex comes in? Yes, yeah, so Alpha Complex is the bunker itself. It could be seen to be the size of like Greater London. It's got sectors within it, which might be the different areas and suburbs and so forth of a, of a city like London. And within those areas, there are self-contained parts to it. So you could potentially cross it over with like the uh, the blocks from uh, Mega City in, in Judge Dredd. City itself is is all underground or, or could be underground. One, one thing, again, which depending on which edition you've looked at, there is definitely a, um, a suggestion that it being underground might not be the only answer. It's in, in many ways, paranoia benefits from a little bit of uh, the, the very topical sort of uh, false news of, of never really knowing or understanding or truly uh, getting the, the full story and sometimes getting so much information that you're not quite sure what's right, wrong, true, false, but having to work with it as your only source of information. Do the adventures emerge from exploring the Alpha Complex or are they delivered in different ways? 
Because this sounds intriguing, this alpha complex. Well, this is where it gets more complicated. Right, okay. This is good. To... <laughs> <laughs> Not, if, if, if any game in its own way suffered from a lack of vision and consistency, it would be Paranoia. Laying out the, the background as I just have, you might already be forming an opinion about what sort of game you could get out of it, but I, I, I bet that anyone who has heard of Paranoia, or at least 9 out of 10 people who've heard of Paranoia, probably think it involves shooting each other, probably before the adventures even started, because you can't trust anybody. Just shoot them now and save worrying about it until uh, after you've submitted the paperwork to, to explain why you shot them during the briefing of the adventure. In a, in a way, West End Games were the company that put out uh, the first three editions of the game. And as time went on, they, they clearly went down the slapstick, um, zap them till they're dead approach to the game, which... Given the fact I gave 1984 as one of your sources of information about the background, definitely doesn't fit in with uh, that that kind of feel. It, it it can all too easily end up being uh, more fast than uh, than anything else. See, when you mentioned um, Gilliam, my ears pricked up because I thought I can I can subscribe to that level of uh, you know visionary madness and uh, yes. creating uh, large scale farce in that way um but yeah the, the sense i get from looking at the rule books i've got the second edition one and uh, that games workshop pull uh, brought out so all the pages fall out <laughs> um and uh, you know you don't get that sense from it you don't get that sense of death it seems very clean and very as you say uh, uh, dare i say it 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 sounds a bit zany zany would be a good way of putting it yes yeah from my point of view as as a as somebody who's played it and somebody who's uh who as you said i I have written some 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 elements elements of it in in my time i've never really dug down deep into the history or the reasons why um western games chose to develop it in the way they did and it may well be as as sometimes happens you have a uh a shift in the uh, people who are involved different staff come and go different writers come and go um and it it definitely took a uh, a slide from uh, beginnings which had almost the potential for a balance between the dark and the and the humor to uh to adventures that were just silly for silly's sake and parodies of things went for the sort of custard pie cla- slapstick more often than not um which definitely would have sold the feeling that you were never going to play more than one adventure of paranoia it was one of those games that you'd pick up and probably have back on the shelf within a few weeks because you will have got sick of uh, uh, shooting each other or at least being shot by uh, those so-called friends that you're playing games with around the table and player versus player rarely leads to that kind of situation of it well where you, where you feel comfortable playing the games you nothing ever nothing ever is going to get done if my, if people spend all their time worrying uh, about you know whether they're going to survive the first 10 minutes of the mission and maybe have to sit out the rest of their gaming session while everyone else is uh, um still still going because you've lost all your clones so so you're indicating that it took a change after the third edition is it so the bizarrest part of it is that it took uh, that change took place after the fifth edition in an act of incomprehensible zaniness um the game went from first to the second edition which you you're holding in your hands to the fifth edition, um, skipping the third and fourth edition altogether. <laughs> and the fifth edition seriously lost its way and became, yeah, zany for zany's sake. It stopped. It had very few of the people who'd been involved in le- early editions, uh, even vaguely involved. It even discounted, we were mentioning Symbrim before, and Paranoia is a game which has a, a, a history of uh, a certain style of art. Um, and in the hands of Jim Holloway, who did most of the art for the first and second edition, um, which gave its its style and its its character, 
he disappeared as well. Um, so the fifth edition has become a bit of an unbook in terms of its existence um, and has been to been deleted much uh, very uh, 19, 1984-esque that yeah. somebody has decided to come back and quietly write it out of Paranoia's history. So um, when in 2004... Um, Mongoose Publishing got the license to do um, Paranoia. Effectively, that was the fourth edition. At that point, that was kind of like when I got involved. Alan Varney took over, uh, took the responsibilities of being the editor and coordinator of the line at that point, and he'd been involved in the past with uh, adventures like Sending the Clones, and he had a certain determination about him to restore some of the uh, the original concepts and bring it back to uh, a, a less zany um, uh, approach to the game where possibly you might be able to even consider uh, having characters uh, run over a few adventures, maybe, possibly, by introducing um, different sort of themes or styles of play. I understand that there's quite a big difference between first edition system and the second edition system it became a lot looser didn't it yes yeah it did for indeed if first first edition had um skill trees which genuinely had like branches which were drawn on the character sheet so you would have uh, a, a really broad base skill and as you got better at it you would you would like draw lines and have have the the, the branches into uh, narrower narrower and narrower skills and so while you had this darkly humorous game, it had a, a very crunchy combat system and that was that was done away with in the in the second edition. By the by the edition that I was working on, it was um just uh, it was just twenty sided dice. Um, yes. which was in 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 the uh, in the noughties, it was uh, after all the flavour of the moment, the D twenty system glut when everybody was writing a system with a d20 in it um so it seems you know probably a sensible idea to uh, use the same sort of mechanic and it was it was very straightforward roll uh, um against your uh, your score and try and get equal to or under it um because in that sort of game you probably it, as with many other games it benefits from concentrating on the story um, because that's that's where the fun probably is, rather than necessarily in rolling the dice. But at the same time, it it, it led to some interesting characters, which would have desperately no, low numbers for for key skills because of complete misguided training. Characters who are who are better able to uh, to do things like knitting than they are to to actually shoot straight. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it led to a much uh, a much simpler system. It did did carry on from from that second edition through to the uh, what was originally called the XP edition. The 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 current version again is sort of gone for a, for a, a, a simpler approach as well. Want, want, wanting to create characters which are sort of simple and 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 fun to to, to play more than anything. And if if anything else, just as I said, to show that these these individuals are desperately, desperately uh, underskilled um, in pretty much every area which would be important to the completion of a mission. And while in some games that would be overcome by depending upon your your teammates, um, in this one you are in exactly the opposite situation. So you have no skills and you can't depend on anyone around you to uh, get you out of a bad situation. Well, this time next week, I'll be games mastering my first game of Paranoia. And I spent my whole uh, gaming life trying to stop my friends from um, killing uh, each other and working cooperatively. So... What I need from you, Paul, is a security clearance ultraviolet. Uh, how do I start, and what's your top tips for a GM of paranoia? This is a terrible spot to be placed in. Top <laughs> to, I, I would suggest, first and foremost, that you both give them too much information and not enough is, is always a good thing. They should not have enough information about what they're doing and why they're doing it, and they should have more information than they can possibly handle about everything else. Um, it, it, that sounds like every game I've ever run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, but, you're, you're supremely uh, skilled. <laughs> your, your expertise is not your issue then. Um, yeah, okay, that's good. Um, 
Uh, there, there are many of the adventures. One, one I was looking at sort of earlier was uh, um, the the adventures should require the troubleshooters, the troubleshooters being the players, to do a, to complete a task, but have the barest information about what they need to do. So, an example which I was looking at was uh, Robot Imani six six five C where the um the mission briefing briefing is fix the bot so they're just told to fix um one of the the, the robots um and that's it that's all they're told and if truth be told the reason why they're told that is because yeah, there's every chance nobody even knows why it needs to be fixed they know where it is and in this case the 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 the, the players are going to get you know the, when when they're sent on their mission they're sent to a specific room and they're basically locked in it with this robot that they have to fix but that's all that's all the information they have from their briefing officer but as a as a somebody running the game it's important that each of the players uh, be fed additional information because within alpha complex you have um you have secret society um which are determined to achieve their own ends um, whether they are the Sierra Club who want to return everybody back to the outdoors, whether they're the communists who believe in the uh, the, the old ways of sharing the means of production and 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 having uh, ev- uh, everything for all, or um, some like the uh, Frankenstein Frankenstein destroyers who believe that all robots should be destroyed. Each of the players will belong to one of those secret societies. And each of the players will also belong to a service group. So it might be the armed forces, or it might be internal security, or it might be production and logistics. And they each have a reason for the, 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 the people who work for them to do the task as well. So having been told to go fix a robot, each person will have been told something extra from their secret society and something extra from their service group. And those might conflict within the character's own mission. So what they've been told to do by one might conflict with the other. But then you've got a room that's got six people in it and each of them will have their own additional orders. So as I said, you you don't give them enough information about what they need to do and you give them way too much information about other people's beliefs of what they need to be doing. If only because... Ideally, that will put them in a bit of a quandary about what information is accurate or true or right and whether they should do the thing that they've been asked by one or the other um, or whether they can find some kind of middle ground. The ideal situation is definitely to put them in a quandary which will have them trying to balance everything out and try and reinforce the fact that they should balance everything out because you know, if they're locked in a in a room then you know unless they do things that appear to complete the mission then they may never get out of the room alive the other thing is to keep throwing up uh, effectively distractions that just make the situation a little bit worse almost like cranking up the tension uh, or the pressure in the situation just to remind them that there's a a deadline to the adventure it, it, but paranoia definitely benefits from a sense of impending doom unless you get on with it and get the job done so this is like throwing in additional npcs or events happening around them yes yeah absolutely. right okay yeah. yeah yeah um and especially when uh those npcs are uh, almost immune to the sort of the plot so Within Alpha Complex, you have, I mentioned earlier about uh, the robots, the, the, the droids that you find. Everyone in Alpha Complex has a security clearance that allows them to access a certain level, level of information. And the lower you are, uh, the, the less information you ultimately have access to. Knowing everything, however, isn't necessarily good because, as I've said, it's not all true and, you know, you, you, you can get access to more things. But generally speaking, that is very much a case of being promoted beyond your capability. So people end up with more power than they can possibly handle and more information they can, they can possibly do anything with while remaining utterly incompetent in, in their ability to get things done. 
but you throw those sort of things so the robots don't have security clearances so if a robot turns up and tries to do something there's not much you can do about it because it's property of the computer and if it starts causing a fuss then what are you going to do with it how can you get it out of the way you don't have any authority over it or you throw in some of the ultraviolets the people who are at the upper end of the security spectrum who tend to uh, come off almost like uh, sort of I don't know, uh, medieval noblemen in that they, you know, dealing with these uh, oiks and, uh, you know, foul creatures of lower security clearances who can't possibly understand what's going on, um, but should do everything you say. And probably, you know, they, they, they will ask you to do things again, which might possibly go against what you've been ordered to do by everybody else, because that's the that's the way it should be. And so you should throw the players up against obstacles which they genuinely have to come up with good solutions for it you shooting everything should no not not be an option finding a way to get around it by bribing fawning fast talking uh, or finding some clever ingenious way to distract people should be the 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 answer more often than not because shooting people is just going to get you dead as well you've intrigued me and um, inspired me to uh, get playing but I imagine that you need to have player buy-in for this kind of game because I can sense already I'm kind of trying to imagine myself playing it with my group and I can imagine them actually killing me in real life the temptation would be to really crank up the frustration uh, to a level where they're exasperated what is the contract that you need to sign with your players and GM to buy into this well, I think as I as I touched on before, if there's any element of a, of a tabletop contract that you need to buy into, it's it's making sure that the players understand that the sort of PvP elements where they're going to be up against the other players need to be yeah. are need to be taken in good humour and not be taken off the table. Um, if anything, it should be it should be an opportunity to it shouldn't be an opportunity just to l- release. Uh, your, you, you know, ag- against everyone around you. Everyone ultimately, like, uh, should have fun, yeah. um, and that, and that should be emphasised from the outset. I'm not particularly worried about them. I'm more worried about me as a games master. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, get them to sign something at the outset, uh, <laughs> yes. that's absolving you of uh, of all crimes and anything else that should happen during the course of the session. I think I'll um, do that. I think I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> in in the game, the, uh, a, 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 a handy tool is the brain scrub, uh, which is uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, to effectively carry out a non lethal punishment that involves people having um, unwanted or illegal thoughts excised from their brains um, through a brain scrubbing. If that was possible with players who thought they knew what paranoia was, it would be a lot easier for you to run. Um, ah, right. Anyone who has heard of paranoia will have preconceptions about what it is, which makes it desperately difficult to get the game running the way you want it to run. Because if you've turned up wanting to run a game that's a little bit more serious, but everyone else's experience has been that it's all three stooges and an opportunity to slap people on the head and shoot them while they've got their back to you. Um, then you're going to have a tougher time than anyone else in the room in getting the game up and running. And and you know then the, ultimately yes they they will enjoy themselves probably, <laughs> but if you as game master have invested money in buying the game and have have hoped to run through a whole adventure, then if the players have got a opinion that it's just slapstick fun, then you're going to have a tough time. And I'm not sure I I have the answer to to how you actually get them to suspend their preconceptions to to allow you to run the version of the game you want to run you know that i'm a big fan of the all rolled up you know i've got a collection i've got my star wars one i've got my dracula dossier one i've got my um custom grognard files all rolled up and uh, i've got loads of stuff because every time i see uh, phil she talks me into buying loads and loads of stuff and <laughs> I know that um, you've recently you've recently um, got the fighting fantasy uh, on the on the all rolled up. T- tell us how that came about. 
uh, if we if we reverse all the way back and it's, it almost ties back to the paranoia again <laughs> back at that point in time in 2004 just as i discovered the paranoia was coming back i also found out that a uh, another game from the dim and distant past called maelstrom oh yeah um well, yeah so it it, it maelstrom was a uh, sort of a very simple paperback role-playing game set in elizabethan times that i think it puffin came out with it yes. almost at the same time as fighting fantasy came out and it felt like they were they wanted to ride the wave of fighting fantasy success um by by producing this game that sort of it was a, just a very simple role-playing game and it was being re uh, republished and uh, by um uh, Graham Botley of Aryan Games, um, and I got involved uh, writing. Well, I initially, with just helping with some proofreading on a companion he was doing, and then I wrote a beggar's companion, which basically expanded one of the character classes in the game. Uh, but it meant that I started going to events with him, uh, which included like Dragon Meat, for example, uh, when it was still in the uh, Freemasons Hall in uh, in Birmingham. And after a couple of years, Phil, my wife, started coming along. Um, and because she's very i'm going to say crafty in that she is good with crafts she makes that she makes things uh sort of and at the time she was making jewelry and bookmarks and all sorts of um clever things and for i i i as a gm would love to have compact sort of setups in terms of being able to go to an event have everything i wanted and i used to find that my dice are in one thing my pens are in another i'd end up carrying a big rucksack that would almost break my spine to carry it around and then once i got it to the gaming table and hoisted the books out i then have to fish around in the bottom for all my bits and pieces and you know pencils and and dice so phil and i had come up with the idea for the all rolled up which you know just the idea that you could have something that had your dice your counters your pens your pencils all in one place all rolled up ready to game and at one of those early events when we were at dragon meet Steve Jackson and uh, Ian Livingston came round to Aryan Games because on top of Maelstrom, uh, Graham Botley was also doing the advanced fight and fantasy game. Probably on the first occasion was slightly sort of starstruck by these, you know, these I icons of, of the gaming industry. And they th so they were there when initially Phil and I were basically taking like a, a foot of space at the end of Graham's table. So he had his, his display of books and we had this little corner where we, we, for the first time, you know, at, at things like UK games expo and dragon meat were bringing along our, our product. And then the next year, Ian, I think Steve actually took an interest in our product. It was mentioned to us that maybe we should talk to him. And then the year after that, we were told, yeah, we, you should definitely get in touch with me, and and we'll we'll see what we can do. Year after that, it was it was pressed even more until finally, effectively, Steve said, seriously, I want you, I, here's my number, sort of thing. Call me, sort of thing. So we, we'd gone from this passing interest into something that he could see. You know, we were four years down the line, and you know we were still going and. Um, it was clear that he was really interested in it because we'd so we actually had the opportunity the first fight and fantasy fest to do a very limited edition when jonathan green organized the event in london to do a limited edition run of of uh, all rolled up with the fight and fantasy covers from uh, the likes of forest of doom and dungeons uh, the death trap dungeon um, so yeah, so uh, Dragon Meet this last year, we finally had the meetup where basically we had the, the the contract and Phil, Steve, and Ian all signed it, um, and we had our first product um, there and then, and we are now in the process of um, uh, sort of expanding that line to not only the the all rolled up tools, but also uh, our uh, folding uh, dice trays and the uh, sort of things like bags and so forth as well so it's been a real sort of experience to almost we weren't quite nurtured by steve and ian but there was definitely the sense that they, they were there watching as we've gone along um and it, so it was really quite a an achievement of fulfillment to to finally get to that stage of signing the contract with them well i'm still in a quandary i don't know whether to go for uh, john blanche's manticore or Ian McCaig's uh, Blood Beast. So as soon as I've decided, I'll be putting an order in. So I'll look out for it. <laughs>
And uh, two final questions, uh, Paul, before I let you go. And the first one is, do you still play a musical instrument? Uh, I, I still play the piano. Right now, I am looking across my... I've got like a study downstairs, which, to be honest, is the dining room, and there is a piano across the room, and so, I, I, I still play the piano. So not, it's not, not a trumpet? No. I used to play the trombone. I played the bass trombone. But I, I could, I, if if you bought one round right now, I could play it for you. But I don't, I don't have one on my own because they're really expensive instruments to own. So. And uh, last question: Have you read Lord of the Rings yet? I did read Lord <laughs> of the Rings. Yes, I read it about ten years ago. You have my sympathies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I read it from cover to cover, except for the appendices. I still haven't read those. I don't think I ever will. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Paul. It's been great having you on. And uh, thanks for spending the time with us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. The White Dwarf! Outside Alpha Complex, looking in. Paranoia, the role-playing game of darkly humorous future. A game that creates a surreal, far-fetched, Kafkaesque nightmare. I mean, really. Who'd believe in a state where... Mindless drones blithely follow each other in an authoritarian leader, a leader obsessed with control and very possibly insane, who issues tersely worded edicts to confuse and terrify the populace. Uh, oh, hmm. Like several other games around the same time, the coverage of Paranoia and White Dwarf benefited from a Games Workshop bounce. The production of a glossy, hardback rulebook, under licence from West End Games, prompted a number of scenarios and articles in the magazine. The original game was reviewed by Marcus L. Rowland back in issue 65. It sounded an intriguing novel setup, but Marcus warned that the game asks more of the referee than many other RPGs. What with having to keep track of secretly of all the players' commendation and treason points, alongside driving the plot forward. Overall, he liked it, but he felt it worked better as a light relief from other games and wasn't sure that he'd want to run a prolonged campaign. Finishing with the warning, Dedicated Rules Lawyers and war gamers will hate it. Cue sharp intake of breath from Blythe. But it wasn't until the release of Games Workshop's hardback of Paranoia that it really came to my attention. Now, I have to admit at the outset that as a time of writing, I've never played Paranoia. Hopefully this will have changed by the time you hear this, as Dirk is running a game online and provided we're not scuppered by the machinations of any commie traitors. I do remember enjoying reading all of the paranoia features in White Dwarf, though. It all sounded great fun, if a bit chaotic. But that was when I was a callow teenager. Now I'm a grumpy old man. So, having reread them all again, how do they hold up? The first paranoia scenario to feature in White Dwarf was the all-new computer horror real action show by Robert Lynn Davis, with some spit and polish provided by Mark Gascoigne in issue 81. This set the template for many of the scenarios that were to follow. It adopted a rather forced, jokey tone. Wouldn't this be fun? and played with dropping genre tropes into the setting of Alfred's complex. In this case, the troubleshooters had to investigate the mysterious, long-abandoned ILM sector and bring back information and tech for the computer, only to run into several monsters from the classic Universal horror films. The structure of the adventure was largely free-form, with no complicated plot, and was all the better for it. Basically, it was a big playground for the games master to pit the troubleshooters against various famous nasties, playing the situation for laughs, while at the same time allowing them to indulge in a number of horror cliches as they built towards an atmospheric gothic finale. Infamously, despite several references to them in the text, 
This adventure was printed in the magazine, presumably unintentionally, without any maps. Q consonation on the letters page. I think this became a bit of a running gag at Gaines Workshop. In his editorial a few issues later, Paul Coburn proudly trumpeted, We have printed some maps for a paranoia adventure. Maybe not the right maps, but... Next up was a short article by Robert Avery in issue 83 called It's a Long Way to Tipa R. Ari dealing with how to get around Alpha Complex and how the Games Master could use bureaucracy, confusion and congestion to make the troubleshooters' lives hell. There are some simple but effective ideas here, although strangely the scenario ideas focused as much on food poisoning as they did on transport. Robert Avery used some of these ideas, including the food poisoning, in a later adventure, which will come soon. And in order to show just how crazy and off-the-wall paranoia was, White Dwarf decided to print the article upside down. Hilarious. Grumpy old man? Me? Issue 84 saw the scenario Ufans no Itari Ipo by James Wallace. Eh? It's Operation Snafu Backwards. White Dwarf decided to print this one on its side with the text of the titles back to front. <sighs> anyway, this was an introductory adventure with a clever, if rather obvious, central conceit as the players embarked on a simulated mission to prove their worth as troubleshooters. The worldview of the game was employed very well here with lots of confusion and sabotage in the setup designed to make the players mistrust each other from the outset. And to please the D&D diehards, it even featured a dungeon into which the players descended to apprehend some commie traitors. A qualified success then, a good introduction to the game, but some of the encounters were very scripted. And it struck me that there was a danger that the players wouldn't be aware of some of the jokes as the scenario played out. The scenarios kept coming. Clearly, many of the White Dwarf writers were inspired by paranoia. Happiness is laser-shaped by Pete Tamlin, with Mark Gascoigne again sprinkling some magic dust, appeared in issue 87. This was a heady mix of food conspiracies and the not-so-secret testing of ancient weapons, with lots of NPCs, each with a puntastic name, for the GM to ham up. The set-piece encounters were variable. Some were good and messy, while others seemed rather superfluous. They were there just to confuse the troubleshooters and keep them occupied. Maybe that's the point. The plot was fairly scripted, but developed nicely and allowed the players to piece together the information that was revealed in order to work out what was been happening. And so, get the joke. Whoa, 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 hang on though. We're several scenarios in, but there's been no mention of Marcus Rowland. There's something wrong here. Ah, issue 89 fixed that with the adventure Do Troubleshooters Dream of Electric Sheep? This had a simple setup. The troubleshooters are given a mission by the high programmer to investigate a threat to his manufactured rural idyll. Once again, I think the scenario benefited from its simplicity, with the humour arising out of the prisoner meets Little House on the Prairie situation. As he'd done with other scenarios for other games, Marcus gave three possible options for how the adventure would play out, allowing the games master to tailor to their individual style, and finishing with a grand assault on Precinct 13 by the way of Shaun the Sheep, climax. It was huge fun to read this once more. I think it really shows the game's potential. Issue 90 featured Fear and Ignorance, Ignorance and Fear by John Saunders. Ostensibly an article on GM style in Paranoia. Only this being Paranoia, it wasn't really a straight article, but more of a send-up piece 
played for laughs. I saw it as a sort of reboot of the Traveller Starbase column We Have a Referee Malfunction from way back in issue 35. Again, the humour was a bit forced and the article also badly showed its age. GMs were recommended to use the presence of a microcomputer to disconcert their players. Back to the scenarios and Marcus Rowland with Little Lost Warbot in issue 91. This was a much bigger and more expansive adventure than Do Troubleshooters Dream of Electric Sheep, with the troubleshooters venturing on a trip to the outside to track down the eponymous Warbot. It was also more scripted than his previous scenario, leaving me with the feeling that at times the troubleshooters could be just along for the ride as events played out irrespectively of their actions. There were some fun encounters though, with scope for enjoyable role-playing, and it did memorably feature some culturally confused pepper pot shaped robots, presumably nicked from some ropey old science fiction show or other. A surprise for all you grognards who think that White Dwarf finished at issue 100, there was another paranoia scenario, Clone Day Surprise, in issue 101. This was written by Robert Avery for Games Day 1987. Does anyone remember playing it there? I doubt you'd have forgotten it if you did. The adventure started with an exhortation to the GM to treat the players as their characters. And throughout the scenario, there were various activities for the players that made the game a cross between role-playing and an episode of the Generation game. For American listeners who aren't up to speed on their British Tea Time TV from the 1970s, think Beat the Clock. The adventure itself had a fun setup. The troubleshooters had to escort a birthday, sorry, a clone day, cake for the computer across the Alpha Complex, incorporating ideas from his earlier article on transport and featured plenty of slapstick encounters and enjoyable cultural references. I imagine the games master would have to tread a careful line running this adventure as described, with buy-in from the players. The task they were set could be very funny, but equally, if the players took against them, they could result in a possible humiliation and the GM being lamped by an irate individual. And there was even more. Issue 112 featured Vulture warriors from Dimension X meet plenty of cheerful orcs with plasma cannon by Ken Rolson. Presumably, this was some kind of Paranoia meets Warhammer 40k article or scenario, but it appeared in a post-Dave Langford issue of White Dwarf. I've not read it, so I can't comment any further. It sounds understated, though. Taken as a whole, the paranoia scenarios in White Dwarf strike me as a bit of a mixed bag. With paranoia, perhaps more than most games, humour is the key. You can fit comedy and light relief into just about any role-playing game, but with paranoia, there's a reliance on the humour. It's integral to the game, and with that reliance, there's a tendency to try and force comedy into the situation. Writing comedy is hard. Lord knows some of the lead balloons I've dropped on Twitter are testament to that. But I think a more subtle approach where the humour emerges from the setup tends to work the best. This is exemplified by two of the best scenarios in White Dwarf, the all-new computer horror real action show and Do Troubleshooters Dream of Electric Sheep. And even if the scenario is funny to read, does it translate to fun at the table? It seems to me that there's a bit of an inherent conflict in these paranoia scenarios. Several of them have reasonably detailed, amusing plot. But isn't the point of the game for the troubleshooters to turn on each other and then to die in repeated, amusingly gruesome ways? Just how much of the adventures will the players actually get through? Isn't that carefully crafted plot a little bit wasted. I think the GM has quite a careful balancing act to pull it off. Having said all that, 
maybe I'll completely change my mind after I've actually played Paranoia. Over to you, Dirk. Okay, so you awake and the fluorescent lights flicker on and you're in a capsule and the sound of pipe music. <laughs> Good morning, citizens. How are you today? Good morning, friend computer. Yeah, I'm great computer. Thanks. Happy, happy as ever. Thanks yeah. for asking. Another glorious day in Alpha Complex. <laughs> I am the computer. The computer is your friend. It's Indeed. It's time to protect and serve. Troubleshooters, time to wake up and take your pills. Oh, uh, yes, the pills, Lindy. the pills, the pills. <laughs> I've already taken my computer. And is it, I'm ahead of the others. Is it, is it the red pill or the blue pill? Uh, yeah. There's a selection of uh, pills at the uh, 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 on a on a central table, and uh, the table kind of lights up, ready for you to uh, take them. Okay, are we expected to do? Do we do this every day? I would guess. Oh yeah, it's time to wakey so wakey, we, citizens. We just do we, do we know what the pills all... do? Do we know what the pills do? <laughs> <laughs> Make That's you good. happy. Well, Make yeah. You happy. Happiness. Okay. Uh, did you, are they of different colours or something? Yeah, there's um, there's uh, five different uh, pills on the on the table, um, and yeah, they do have uh, different uh, different colours. There's blue, red, yellow, orange. I picked the red one. I picked yeah, the red one. Red pill. The red pill. Okay, people taking the red pill, please uh, roll a d20. <laughs> I want to see what happens first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come, come, citizens! Please take your pills. You feel bouncy and bubbly, ready to take on the day. Uh, I start jumping. Uh, uh, yeah, be being bouncy, literally bouncy, uh, where I'm standing. Hello, everyone. I'm Jam Arvum, but uh, you can call me Jam. Okay, I am uh, Karina. Karina R MSQ one, but you can call me Karina R MSQ one. Uh, <laughs> I have. A... Hello everyone. My name is Cart R Z M U one, uh, and uh, I'm uh, a gentleman, hairbrushed and parted. A great example of uh, Alpha Complex uh, maildom. I work for technical services. <laughs> in the medical services division so if any of you citizens are feeling at all unwell um, please report to me and i'm sure to make you better okay uh hello i'm suza rqpz1 she's a small woman she looks a bit like joe's girlfriend in moonraker so if you want me to test any weapons for their effectiveness on you i'm your woman robot imana 665c is reported to be malfunctioning. The following troubleshooters will report directly to George B. Mim for acting undersecretary to the temporary assistant to the director of research and design, sector M E M for assignment. Thank you for your cooperation. Oh no, a malfunctioning robot, that's such a pity. And when you arrive at the office door of uh, George B. M. E M four. You notice uh, that unlike the other doors in the sector, uh, which are kind of covered in blast and scorch marks, his door has been scrubbed clean and uh, printed on the door a number of names and titles which have been crossed out. And uh, there's a, a red clearance painter from Housing Preservation and Development and Mind Control is stooped over and he's working on a new title. Acting Under Secretary to the Temporary Assistant Direct, and he's just up to that point. Uh, and the <laughs> the letters are written in bold blue paint. The HPD and mind control worker opens the door for you, and then scurries aside. Good work. Keep it off. 
The department's watching you. The computer's watching you. Everybody's bloody watching me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, the foundation of our uh, utopian society here. You sound like you're unhappy, citizen. Don't get me into that. I got me in trouble. I'm already on my third clone. Are, are, are you unhappy, though? I mean, you know. Just bugger you, you off and get in the bloody office, will you? Stop talking to me. <laughs> what, what's your name, citizen? <laughs> Have you found your dice bag? <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask him. <laughs> I'm still bloody looking. Go on, get in. Get in. Don't talk to Let's me. Let's get in. Last lot that no. talked to me. I got bloody sent to a termination chamber. Minute. Not giving your name is a treacherous act. Yeah, absolutely. He sounds like you. Uh, you it's 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 the uh, commies who who try to hide their identities and are not honest and open. And you, you sound like you could be a commie. Oh, it's dice D four. <laughs> Tasty dice for. be ag. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I'll, I'll make a mental note um, to uh, report him later. I think, and wish him good day. You're in this uh, uh, office, and it's it's quite a big office, but there's piles and piles of paper uh, on this desk. Jam uh, Avum one. Uh, acting under security uh, to temporary assistant director. I'm reporting for a mission. Oh, it's about time you came. I've been expecting you for some time. You are right. And uh, uh, yes, uh, I should, I'd like to report a uh, citizen who uh, I suspect be under commie influence. Uh, the citizen's name is Dice D4. Dice D4? He, he, you've not seen anybody yet, but you can hear him, a computer, fire up. And he, and he reports uh, Dice v D4. And outside the door, you can hear a small. <laughs> it's, it's such a pity. Uh, I don't understand uh, why someone like that wouldn't be entertained uh, as he should be. Of course, of course. Yeah. So uh, you're the you're the fodder, are you? Emerging from behind the desk, there's a man who's wearing little round glasses. And he's being played by Ian Holm. Uh, <laughs> and he's a little tiny, tiny guy. He's only a metre tall. Yes, I've been expecting you. You've took your time. I, I, I ordered I ordered, I ordered, ordered Troubleshooter some days ago. Where it, have you it, been? It was, a, it was a tall order getting here, I say. Well, well, <laughs> don't, don't fall short on this mission. Uh, we, we've got high hopes. We won't, we won't. <laughs> yes, this, despite being short-staffed. Mm. I think we are there. Susha, 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 is that your name? Susha, what? Yes, you're, you're, la you're laughing. You're laughing at my uh, mission. No, no, no. No, that's not so. Coordination will be seen as treason. I have made a note of it for friend computer. <laughs> I need you to fix the bot. The bot needs fixing. Is this Imana 665C? The very same, the very same. Technical well, services, I have to say, technical services are unfamiliar with this particular designation. Is this, this, um, what are you, you any... what are you inferring, Cart? I'm just uh, loyally following technical services protocols, and uh, we, 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 have, we have no sort of records of, uh, of this particular designation. Uh, just in, in, my, in my eagerness to serve Frank Computer, I was, I was just trying to get as much information as I possibly can. To, to help with the mission, you understand. Oh, you technical services lot are useless. You got us into this position in the first place. Absolutely mm. useless. Why did they send them? I shall make a note. And he writes <laughs> into his uh, little pad. Uh, the You said this bot was malicious. Manus and anger, who can determine it? We've not been able to get near the damn thing. Okay, that, that doesn't sound like a, what a robot would do. <clears throat> I, I, I would also like to make a a, a proposition, uh, George, which is that uh, I think a, a, a uh, so a documentary to show you citizens working together to bring a, a rogue robot under control. I'm, I'm concerned, it. citizen Karina. Why are you wishing to collect such intelligence? 
You're hey, not a communist, are you? Games Master Screen! Welcome to the virtual room of role-playing rambling. I couldn't get Blythe, so instead I've got one of his clones. Hello, J-U-D Blythe E2. Hello, Dirk. Um, so we need to apologise if you sound a bit uh, crackling, a bit wobbly, because it's you're not the real thing, are you, this time? I'm not another real thing, and, and anything I say... Um cannot be ascribed to uh, the real Judge Blythe, unless it's um, brilliant, in which case it can. So, same as usual then. So, I've got a Games Master screen here, so I'm going to roll on a table, apparently mm-hmm. at random, and select some paranoia-related topics. Um, but I'm going to erect this shield between us. Uh, in this case, it's a XM9357 portable nuke blast shield, because you can't be too careful. <laughs> you can't. No, okay. <laughs> right, are you ready for this? I'm ready. Brace, ready yourself. Have a Brace yourself, are you ready? Okay, I'm rolling on a D20 because it's all about D20s in this game. Yeah, it is. Oh, and that's a 16. Back in the day. Oh. So we're gonna, I'm going to transport you back in the day because this okay. is 1987. And I've reconstructed your your bedroom in this virtual space. Very good. Yeah. So, gone are the uh, Rodney Matthews posters. Where did they go? I don't know. You got rid of them. Gone though. Yeah. They got. They got. You move on, don't you? You move on. Instead, there are Blade Runner stills in Mm. frames. In frames. In in frames. Uh, Classy. Classy. I'd grown up a little bit. Decided if you frame things on your wall, somehow it. It's more legitimate. <laughs> and But there's still a black mark on the wall where you threw your traveller rule book. Yeah, the black mark's still there from uh, Starship Combat Frustration. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no top deck, Shandy. Uh, so instead what I've got is a, uh, a litre bottle of uh, Boddington's, a plastic one, from uh, Fred's yes. off-licence, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which a few years earlier gave me my first hangover. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, hang on. I'm just going through this record collection. Where's Where's the Ario Speedwagon gone? Oh, they've been moved to the back. <laughs> the Smiths meet his murder. Oh, you've changed. I'm a clone. <laughs> Although it was a clone, I should be the same, shouldn't I? Yeah. That's how it works, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe I'm not a clone. <laughs> or something's gone wrong. So, Paranoia, mm. you, you actually got this game, didn't you? But... For some I reason, I don't think I knew you'd got it. Why did you get it? Well, I think in around 87, um, things started to go a little bit pear-shaped with role-playing, didn't they? Um, yeah. We're meeting less. We're meeting less, weren't we? We're, we're meeting less. And I think it was back to me and you, wasn't it, Uh and I, I, I bought a series of uh, of games around that time. And I think in some senses I was kind of you know, clutching at straws a little bit, trying to find something that, uh, that it, somehow if I, if I got a new game, it would reinvigorate everything and back to the good old days. Um, and I bought Paranoia. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why, really, because, I mean, the cover, the cover of the, of the Games Workshop edition is a pretty good clue as to the kind of game that's inside. Um, which I didn't particularly like when I bought it. So, but but you look at the cover, and you, you, know, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. But I think you can judge Paranoia by its cover. <laughs> People in red dungarees with weird zany smiles on their faces. It's it's you know it's not it's not gritty uh, RuneQuest, is it, or <laughs> something like that. So I can't, I honestly don't know why I bought it. I think it was just kind of an act of desperation, really. That you know. Yeah, it's got it's got a wacky robot with a chainsaw sawing the top yeah, of yeah, his yeah. head off. Exactly, yeah. And uh, I, when I look at it now, I think, why did I buy that? What was I, what was I thinking? Um, but I think it was a time when I had a, I had a bit more money, but, but not as much role-playing time. So rather than playing games, I spent time buying games and then being a little bit disappointed. Um, I, I think the reason you never found out that I got it is because I, I did take... Um, I, I, I did take an instant dislike to it, really. Um, why is it because it, well, I, I think 
I mean, we've played it since, and I have a I have a different, slightly different view on it. But this is this is back in the day. Um, I, I think the reason I took a dislike to it is because it it didn't do the things that we were used to a role playing game doing. So I felt a little bit like uh, Rick Wakeman listening to a, his first punk song. You know, I was like a like a prog rocker who'd suddenly punk had come along, something very different, and I didn't really like it. Because I think the, the things we did with role-playing games um, from very early on was have long, long campaigns um, of our own devising, where you played characters for a long time and you developed a story and your character developed and that kind of thing. And, of course, the first thing that hits you about paranoia is that that's not going to happen because you've got these sick clones. Your character's got sick clones and they're all pretty much doomed to die in various horrible ways. So that was an appealing. And and I think the other thing was, well, there's two other things. One was that it, it became very obvious to me that you, you at that point, we were back to just you and me playing one-on-one. -on -one. And it's not a game you can play one-on-one -on -one no, at all. Exactly. No. Because the, the whole idea is that the players have their own agendas and betray each other and work against each other. Um, so that that didn't seem to to work, but I think more perhaps more than anything, um, apart from the fact it, it was a bit silly, it was it comic, it was deliberately comic, wasn't it? It was deliberately comic. Yeah. Um, but I think as well on top of that, it, it was I didn't like the idea that players worked against each other because yeah. we we'd had a history of playing role-playing games with a with a couple of difficult characters not yes. not everyone we played was difficult but there were, there were a couple of difficult characters yeah well we mentioned them on here don't we so yeah. I, I i know what you mean the idea of uh, playing a game of this with um, simon would have been yeah well, well simon played traveler like paranoia even yeah. <laughs> even though you shouldn't <laughs> so the idea of the idea of giving him a game where you had license to do that just filled me with dread so I, I remember reading it for all those kind of reasons I just I remember putting it to one side and thinking oh god you've wasted your money there haven't you blithe <laughs> so it, it just didn't work for me at all it didn't you know it, yeah. it's basically that thing where I, I mean looking at it now it, it, it is quite a revolutionary game it is kind of quite groundbreaking in, in many respects but I, I think then just felt like this isn't what I like about role playing games. It was everything I didn't like about a yeah. role playing game. It, it's strange because uh, back in the day, I was aware of um, Paranoia just through its coverage in White Dwarf, but I was mm. kind of zoning out of uh, role playing games around uh, that point. And for some reason, I'd assumed wrongly, obviously, I'd kind of conflated the idea of Paranoia with Killer. Do you remember Killer, the Steve Jackson? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was, I, I never had that, but I used to read it in the uh, toy shop because that was the thing where you could um, murder your friends with a water pistol or um, electrocute, <laughs> electrocute them with a, a dressing gown belt, wasn't it? That was mm. the idea of that. You were meant to turn ordinary objects into and uh, pretend that they were killer objects. And for some reason, I just thought that paranoia was an extension of that you mm. know kind of uh low level larping yeah yeah i can see i can see why you would think that because it i mean in a sense it is it's, it's not it's not like that but it is it is like that in as much as unlike a lot of role-playing games or perhaps perhaps I, I dare to say maybe unlike any role-playing game at the time it set players against each other yeah and that that was something I never really liked. I've never, I've never quite bought into the idea of players betraying each other in the game because you know the the thief who stabs the paladin in the back and steals the treasure and then says, "Oh well, you know, it's just it's just my character. It's not me." <laughs> All right, is it not? We'll see about that next time. <laughs> I roll another character up, and it and it breeds it breeds kind of ill feeling. I think. You can see, though, that this could be um, a good pressure valve for those players who like playing like that. So you could give them a space yes. in this game to get that off the chest um, if they were playing long-term games. But 
I suppose you're right. You know your own group, don't you? You know how your group reacts. And even even you think about Eddie, you know, this, this style of play, and, and we recently set up a game, and he said, I just don't want to play it because it, it, yes. you just can't imagine Eddie playing this game. It's just not his style of play at all, is it? No, no. I mean, I mean that said, I think when we did play it, um, it was enjoyable because I think you're right. It sets up a space where you can do that. And once you establish the fact that you can kill each other and betray each other, it does become quite good fun in play. That said, though, I, I do think it's because it, it was also fun because we are more mature as players. Some may disagree, but, um, you know, we're all mature middle-aged men with, with a sense of perspective on these things. Whereas when you're a, a teenager or, or a young teenager, a bit different. I, I, I can't imagine a load of 13-year-olds playing it. It could become quite ugly. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> because let's, let's... It, is, it is competitive, you know. Yeah, let's roll on the dice. Oh, and that's uh, 12, and that's comedy. So it's um it's it's billed as we've said as uh, the role playing game of a darkly humorous future. Mm. See that's yes. t- t- to me that's that is part of the problem, isn't it? Because um it's that thing, isn't it, where I, I, you know we we played the game um recently, and the build up for it, I felt a kind of anxiety about it because I thought it's got to be funny. It's got to be comic. Yes. And yet, you know, we have comedy in all games, don't we? Well, yeah. And, and Neil, uh, as before we were, when we were chatting before we played the game, um, Neil, you know, Benson, made a very, very astute observation, I think, that there, there is comedy in all role playing games. Yeah. Because yeah. even if there's not comedy in the game, there is comedy around the table. Because, so even if you're playing a, a, a very dark game of Cthulhu where people are going mad and being disemboweled and what have you, there's still laughter because, you know, the duff rolls and the stupid ideas and all, all the kind of stuff that goes on in a role playing game. The characterization, so, you know, Absolutely, people behave yeah. in a particular way, yeah. Yeah, so you've, got, you've always got comedy, so you, you're right. If you then say, but this, this is, is a comic game, there is this tremendous amount of pressure on everybody yeah. to make it funny. It's which a bit is odd. It's a bit like those uh, charity events at work where you're expected <laughs> to dress up in a particular way and people are kind of enforcing fun on you, um, yes. but not in your terms. Yes. And I think that's yes. a, that's the problem of setting it up as a comedy role playing game, isn't it? Well, it is, it is because you, you're right. If you play a regular role playing game, there will be laughter, but there's no particular pressure for that laughter to occur. It yeah. just naturally does. But if if you say, now I've got this game for you all to play, you've never played it before, it's called Paranoia, and it's a very, very funny game. The minute you say that, oh, come on then, make us laugh. You know, I mean, it's a, it, it's a little bit like people in in uh, in acting say that comedy actors comedy character actors are dismissed as lightweight but comedy is far more difficult to portray and get across than serious drama and i think that's true in this case isn't it that <laughs> i mean i could i could almost sense it when we played it in your in your voice the kind of anxiety is this funny enough <laughs> Well, yep. but it, it, you know, is it funny enough? Because it's supposed to be funny. <laughs> well, my I, I, my instinct is to kind of keep things moving along and keep uh, a sense of um, sense of stuff happening. So you can, you would think on paper that instinctively this would be a game for me, but somehow it made me very self aware um, of the things that I was doing in in a way that made me conscious that I was trying to do it. Rather than yes. relying on my instincts, if you if you get what I mean, I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I mean. It, the, the comedy in a game comes naturally and almost mm. unconsciously, um, but in this case, you are thinking, "I, I must be funny." 
I have to be funny because it's darkly humorous. <laughs> it's easy to be dark, but but there's still a little bit of pressure to be humorous. <laughs> okay, well let's uh, let's roll again. Nineteen. So ah, uh, this is the converse of that then. So you, you said uh, you said it's easy to be dark. What about the darkness, the bleakness, um, in, in the game? Because that's what that that's that's what struck me about it. That reading this again. Um, and read it, well, reading this for the first time is I saw glimmers of things that I found interesting to explore. And when I was talking to Paul, he mentioned he, he mentioned um, Brazil and Gilliam's Brazil and that kind of bleak, highly bureaucratic his madcap look at 1984, isn't it? Orwell's 1984. And yeah. I thought I can plug into that. Because I've never been able to find a way into paranoia's mise en scène, really. You know, that idea of the daftness, the zaniness. Yes. I've never been yeah. able to find a way in. And I know that lots of people like uh, Jim Holloway's illustrations, but I don't. They kind of, I find them off putting. I find mm. that it sets a mood that I can't subscribe to. But by putting that, maybe it's, you know, that my inner earnestness, but putting that idea of darkness in it is something that appeals to me going back to the idea of it being a, as a game is the setting itself isn't particularly repellent or, or difficult because even when i when i got the game I, i'd read a lot of science fiction and i'd read a lot of science fiction that was humorous and a lot of science fiction that was kind of you know, in that kind of vein, you know, of, of paranoia. So there's there's lots of stuff out there. But I think it's it's the problem of a setting for a game. It's like anything, isn't it, in role playing? It's one thing to look at a setting or a book or a novel or an idea and say that is a fascinating idea for a novel or a film, or whatever. But it, it something happens when you turn it into a game setting, which makes it either fantastic or difficult. And that that's the way I kind of feel about it. That yes, as a, as a setting, you can you could look at it as a dark setting. You can look at it as as they say Terry Gilliam's Brazil or that kind of thing. But I don't know. As a game, does it? It has it. That, the fact it's a game brings problems and difficulties yeah. that need to be overcome. I think. But I think it's that it is those preconceptions as well because everybody brings the knowledge of. Mm the slapstick to the table as well don't they so yeah 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 in the in the xp edition so that's the mongoose edition um alan varney gives you different modes of play so you can have the classic mode which is you know rapid fire slapstick and um, mm. where you know your troubleshooters are fighting each other um it in his version he refers to the darkness as straight you know where there's fear suspicion People are striving for power. Um, you know, you get those catch twenty two situations that you can't get mm. out of. Yeah. Um, and then it, finally, there's a zap mode, so a zap style of play, which is highly um, uh, pop culture parodies. Um, mm. You know, where you, you might encounter, I don't know, a cartoon character in one of them, or it might be a, a parody of Lord of the Rings, that kind of thing. Um, mm. And I think I think it's useful. Uh, it's useful to do that, um, and I think it's a, it's a good innovation in, in this mongoose edition that it gives you that um, style of, and modes of play, which I suppose we'll also see in uh, Night's Black Agent because that presents different styles of play, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 But, but I really would. I really would like to have a go at running this. A bit dark. I mean, I did try that when we when we ran the game, but I kind of <laughs> let myself down by. Uh, by, <laughs> by you let yourself down. I let myself down by putting the uh, bullseye music theme tune. <laughs> the bullseye theme tune at the beginning. I think once you did that, all the darkness disappeared, <laughs> and it became uh, slapstick. Yeah, I thought I thought it was being ironic, but I forgot. Okay, let's roll again. <laughs> uh, that's three. Uh, plays the thing. 
Yeah. So we've played the game. So how do you yeah, find okay. actually playing it? Because that's, that's well, the important I, thing, I, isn't it? I feel, I feel in some respects I've been a little critical of it so far. You've been um, very critical. Very critical. Well, yeah, well, Blythe hasn't. This is his clone speaking. Don't hold it against me, everybody. That's nothing the, to do, it's nothing to do with Blythe. It's, this is his, this is his clone. That's the thing with this game, though, isn't it, uh, Blythe, is that everybody's been saying to us, haven't they, and, you know, you, um, you must play this game. You'll yes. love this game. Oh, when are you going to do a podcast about Paranoia? It's yeah. great. There's, You'll love it. There's, there's a lot of love for it out there, um, definitely. And and I have to say, having played it, I can see why. Because we did have a fantastic time playing it. We did. We did. And I suppose it, it, was, a true, it was a real... It, it was a real laugh. It was real, really good fun. It was. It was very funny, very entertaining. And we should uh, thank we should thank the patrons for voting for it because I don't think if uh, if they hadn't have voted for it, I wouldn't have done it because the contrarian in me, as soon as people say you must play this game, <laughs> says I I will not play this game. I'll decide what game I I'll will play. not like because you're <laughs> telling me I will like it. I will not like it. I'll decide whether I like it. Not you. <laughs> so, so, so I, I was, I was pleased to uh, play. So, what, what elements of the, of the game did you enjoy? Well, I, I think what came across was we, we were, we were rather blessed having good players. So we had, uh, not including myself in this, but I had three other players who were very, very good players. And I suppose it goes back to what I said originally that when I originally got the rules, some of the people we played with um, were a bit bit tricky to deal with and and that's why it didn't appeal and of course what you realize as with all role playing games is once you get the right players doing the right things it it all comes alive and it was it was really enjoyable um it, it was it was good to have those hidden agendas and not knowing what anyone else was up to <laughs> it was very very entertaining um and what what was what was fascinating about it was it was a very very simple scenario that that just ran its in some respects as players we we started running the game not you there was a there was a shift in balance and power wasn't there that there was a point I think where you clearly thought I've lost control <laughs> these people are just doing their own thing. <laughs> Trying yeah, to kill each other. It was it was a strange thing because everybody <laughs> promised me that I could be a megalomaniac uh, games master and uh, you know just uh, dominate proceedings. But mm. I soon found that once you uh, encounter so, so the scenario we played, we should say, is the one that was recommended by Paul, and that was uh, Robot Emana Six Six Five C, and he ended up being in this lock room with a robot with the intention of uh, with the mission to repair it um, but as soon as you got in there that's when the mayhem started didn't it? That... <laughs> <laughs> well to, to be fair the mayhem started in the briefing office but I yeah. think I think somebody one of us said oh come on let's get on with it <laughs> yes I don't yeah. think I, I think if, if we hadn't said that I think we may not have even got out of the briefing room I think all six of our clones would died in the briefing room. Yeah. I think I got my first clone got killed for laughing, <laughs> but that was me laughing, not my clone. <laughs> you said you said you're laughing. Are you dead? I, you, I, get, you get zapped. No, I gave you trees. I thrift, thrift. I gave you treason points for that. <laughs> I think uh, you got vaporized for trying to hack into the computer very conspicuously. No, uh, no, the, no, no. The thing, I think one of them got killed for laughing. No, I think I, I, I think you're right. Sorry. I think it, I think you'll find that it's on tape. <laughs> that, that, that you, that you but, but, yeah. but but I, but I think I, what was fascinating that was fascinating because uh, I know you were tweeting bits from the from the rule book uh, earlier in the week, uh, and it does give that impression that this is a game where the games master can kill you at the drop of a hat, and uh, and of course you can, and of course you did. Um, but <laughs> but it was it was fascinating by the end of it that there was this shift in power. That suddenly, because we all accepted that we were going to die, and we were all accepted that we were trying to kill each other and betray each other, you didn't have to do very much by the end of it. We we yeah. would we were sending new messages, betraying each other, and 
trying to, <laughs> trying to kill each other and do this and do that. Yeah, you, so, just, you just have to sit there, really. Yeah, so you're all members of uh, different secret societies with different bits of information. And um, some of you were pro the robot, some of you were against it. So some of you were trying to silently wreck it and sabotage it. Others were trying yes. to rescue it as some kind of yes. great um, power uh, thing. Yes. As you say, really, that was all, all uh, redundant because you just ended up uh, fighting with each other. I, I, I must admit, because uh, you, you haven't listened to the coaching that Paul gave me beforehand, uh, how to run it, um, and it has to go down as a, as a failure on my part because what, what he said was, <laughs> if, you frame it, if you frame it correctly, the uh, troubleshooters will be able to negotiate and uh, be able to work through uh, different uh, situations and uh, come to terms with each other's fa factions. Uh, clearly, uh, well, that that worked, didn't it? Um, <laughs> particularly, particularly when Daily Dwarf made my clone's head explode. Clone number three, I think. Oh no, 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 number four. <laughs> But it's, but it, it's very, it, it's oddly, as a player, it is oddly liberating to think I my clones will die in ridiculous ways, everyone will try and betray me, and I have the, I, I, I can try and betray them. That's all legitimate behaviour in this game. Despite the things I said earlier about not liking those things, and I, I still think I, I wouldn't like them in a regular role-playing game. But in this particular environment, it, it, you're right, it does give you a space where you can do all that. And in, in some ways, it's, it, is, it is a real refreshing change. I, I'm not sure I could play it every week, and I'm not sure, it, I think it'd be difficult to have a long-term campaign. And it might long-term get a little bit boring when you end up shooting each other all the time. But every now and again... I think it's uh, it is a real refreshing change, and it it does make it realise that even though, you know, when I read it and bought it way back, I didn't see it, and I don't think I wanted to see it because I was quite comfortable with all my kind of assumptions about role playing games and what they were and what they were for and what they were meant to me. It it, it is kind of quite a breakthrough game, you know. Yeah, it, it is a breakthrough game that that presents you with something very, very, very different. You know, I would like to have a go at running it with um, a good group, uh, like we had, and um, more straight. I would love to try and crack that thing where um, it, you could do campaign play by um, being more. You know, it's more about um, reporting on your uh, reporting on your fellow troubleshooters rather than taking direct action with uh, lasers and the suspicion breeds as you know you like the Stasi you're collecting information and uh, intel to serve to the computer and the authorities um, on yes. your fellow members that that to me see sounds intriguing and that that's what I want to get to I like yeah 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 I like being the computer I mean I've worked in customer service for 26 years so I'm quite good. I'm quite good at adopting that kind of friendly, uh, friendly t tone that is also indifferent. So you know that passive aggressiveness and unhelpful. Yeah. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm very. Well, yeah, you were you were yeah. surprisingly good at that. I give you that. I mean, that's What's professional. That? That's your, your professional skills coming through, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, your call is important to us. Yeah. That kind of thing, but <laughs> I yeah, yeah but, but I would I would I would like to have a go at um, playing it straight, seeing if it is possible to do it in that way, still having um, still having an element of uh, absurdity to it, but having you know a, focusing on that on that paranoia because some of the secret societies are really good as well, and you can see. Mm. How, you could make those very uh, effective. Um, well, yeah, I, yeah, I think I think you could, and it's also fair to say that we had a we had a game of it, and it was it was new it was new to us as a game. Um, we knew about it, but we'd never played it, so it was new as a game. 
and, and, I, and there's still there was always that sense of you still finding your feet a little bit. Uh, and, and I suppose, despite what I just said, if you played it for longer periods of time, I suppose the, the dynamic might change and the way you play it might change. So it might, it might not end up it shooting would, each other with lasers all the time. It would have to, wouldn't it? It would have to. Or else you wouldn't get past uh, the first hour, would you? Not really, no, no. But I, but I do I do find it I, find, I do find it fascinating to think, as I said earlier, of thirteen, fourteen year old boys playing this game. Because I think I think back to some of our early role playing uh, experiences and role playing games, which, which were just a kind of standard role playing games, were sometimes slightly chaotic and a bit a bit mad. <laughs> if you give if you gave some young teenage boys a game like this, well, I dread to think what it would end up like. I really do. It must be, it must have been crazy. You know, it was crazy. We were, you know, middle aged men playing it. But the idea of uh, the idea of us picking up and playing this back in the day when we were younger, I, I don't know. I don't know what we would have made of it or done with it. I was going to ask you, would you play it again? But you've you've answered that, so I'm going to ask you a different question. Okay. Would you run this game for us? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I suppose one of the one of the problems with it, there were times when the rules didn't seem to matter, and the stats didn't seem to matter. But at the same time, there are rules and there are stats. And I thought, well, when when do you use? When do you make a roll? When do you not make a roll? You know, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. um, it, it it just kept to keep the flow. Um, we role played a lot of the situations. So instead yes. of using a, a, a bootlicking skill, for example, mm. yeah. it just allowed you to be a bootlicker. You know, so um, it is that, and it it. <laughs> There's like a, a big range, isn't there, between um, numbers and, uh, you know, your stats can range from uh, 1 to 20 just on the roll of a dice. And... Well, yeah, and I, I suppose the, the stats feel comic as well. So the stats themselves feel jokey, just that idea of rolling a d20 and it being either 1 or 2 or 18, 19, 20, that, that huge range, you know, between the lower end and the upper end it gives you that sense of that even that's comic isn't it yeah but so so in answer to that question would you run the game would you be a games master i'd probably give it a go but right. i think i think it would be I, I think it's hard work isn't it I, I must admit i felt i felt far more exhausted by the end of playing this as a player than other games when i've been a player yeah, I don't know. I don't know you felt as a games master, but it, it it was it was fun. It was a lot of fun, but it it required you to be very very sharp and very very sort of. You, oh, you no. can't really coast, can you? No, no. You know, sometimes, particularly as a player, sometimes in a role playing game, you can coast, can't you? You can be the uh, wizard at the back and go, wow, oh, just fire a fireball every now and again, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. You've noticed but, that. But, I, I've noticed that it's Dom Kings, yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, but it, not in this. I think in this you've you've got to get in there, you know, and, and participate in it and, and engage with it, which is fun, but it's it's demanding, I suppose, demanding. So while well, we get our uh, uh, diaries out to book a dating for when you're running the game, uh... <laughs> well, as you know, I'm uh, I'm Blythe's clone. <laughs> well, just uh, this, this very conversation, it, it could be seen as an act of treason by the computer, which means I may not be around for much longer. So you can't really hold it, me to it, I'm afraid. I mean, you can, but you know, it's only a matter of time before I'm vaporized. Well, before you are, can you just uh, reach that Ario Speedwagon album out and we'll listen to that before we go? All right. <laughs> Now, that would be an act of treason, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to keep on loving you, computer. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that, Judd Blythe E2. Okay. Until next time, thanks. <laughs> Goodbye. Do us another bit. I didn't vaporise him for laughing. You heard it, didn't you? I waited until later when he tried hacking the computer. 
This is why you need surveillance, people. Thank you to Paul Bodowski for his advice and contribution to this episode. I put a link in the show notes to his publishing house, Just Crunch Games, where you'll find Cthulhu Hack, his lightweight, old-school game in the world of Lovecraft. There's also a link to All Rolled Up, so you can check out those fantastic accessories featuring classic covers from Fighting Fantasy. Paul and his wife Phil are supporters of the Patreon campaign, which helps to fund the podcast and supporting project. We're extremely grateful to all of the people who donate monthly to the campaign. Thank you. Thanks too for participating in the poll last year and selecting Paranoia as a game for us to look at. We've had some new people join us in February 18, but I'm going to thank you all individually next time. For those who pledge $5 or more, we'll get a virtual gift. And next time, I'll be giving you a superpower. Because episode 20 will be about Golden Heroes, Games Workshop's first ever homegrown RPG. Thanks to John Dawson, who kindly donated a copy of Paranoia Rules to the Great Library of RPGs. And last, but no means least, thanks to Blythe, Neil, Alan and Callum for taking part in the game. Paul said that it was important that I achieved player buying, and it was essential so that player versus player was handled with good humour. Callum is the host of the wonderful Released podcast, and he's about to become a father. Excellent. Well, if you need any babysitters, don't ask me. Yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 I would, I would give my baby to a filthy commie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Best wishes to Callum and Persephilia from us all. Until next time. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>